in a world that's ever changing. I'm thankful that I get to live in the United States of America. I'm thankful that I get to live in Mississippi. I'm thankful that I get to pastor a church in Louisiana. I cannot tell you how thankful I am that I get to raise my five children here in America. I'm thankful for our Constitution. I'm thankful for the Declaration of Independence. I'm thankful for our founding fathers and that our founding fathers were willing to declare their independence as one nation under God. I am thankful that we get to worship God freely here in the United States of America. I'm thankful that we get to attend church. Listen, I pastor a church and I'm a Baptist, but I'm thankful that here in America, that you and I, we can worship God freely. Listen, you can choose to go to church and you can choose not to go to church. There's many, many uh, people that live in America who chooses not to go to church, but there are many that choose to go to church. I have friends that are Catholic. I have friends that are Baptist. I have friends that are Pentecostal. I have friends from every denomination, from every walk of life. And, and we get together well. We don't talk a whole lot of religion, uh, for say, but we do talk a lot of politics. We might not agree on, on every single doctrine that's in the Bible, but our ideology whenever it comes to policy, our ideology whenever it comes to the role of government, it is almost one. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we had some founding fathers that was willing to stand and that was willing to say, you know what, enough's enough. We're going to declare our independence and we're going to stand and we're going to, we're going to unite together and we are going to form a more perfect union, the United States of America. And I'm thankful for that. There is a, there is a conception out there, and it's a misconception in my opinion, of this separation of church and state to where you have many people who they want to try to do everything they can to keep people like me silent. They don't want me to be vocal about political ideology. Uh, they don't want me to be vocal about policy. They want me to be quiet about it. They, they want to say things like this. Well, if you're going to be involved in it, and if you're going to voice your opinion about policy, or if you're going to voice your opinion about how government should or how government should not work, then we're going to tax the church. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that. You, you have to pay taxes. Let me just make something clear real quick. Now, I'm a pastor of a church, and, and my church, they do give me a salary, and I pay taxes. <laughs> I pay taxes on my salary. I pay Social Security just like everybody else. I pay taxes just like everyone else. I am not, I, I don't get a tax exemption to where I don't pay taxes. I pay taxes like anyone else. And so many times people want to say, well, we're, we're going to tax you. Well, first of all, I already pay taxes. And so that's already, a, that's already, a, I already do that. But, but I mean, feel free to tax me, even though I'm already paying taxes. And, and I will say that I believe that I pay way too much taxes, but that's a whole nother conversation. But they want to try to say, we have to keep the church and, the church and government separate. And to some extent, I agree. To some extent, I agree that we need to keep the government out of the church's business, 100%. But I believe this with all my heart, that the reason why we're in the shape we're in today in our country is because the church has went silent. You have a lot of preachers all over America. They're scared that they're going to offend someone. They're scared that, that they're going to make someone mad, or they're scared that they're going to run somebody off from their church. So they're scared to get up and preach and to talk about how, how it's important that you and I now, we are pro-life, and we fight for the life of the unborn. Uh, they want to say to me that you don't need to preach that. That is politics. In my opinion, that is not politics. In my opinion, that is 100% standing for children who are not yet born. And I can give you a whole host of verses that talks about the baby in the womb. And that baby in the womb is just as much alive as you and I are. Now, yes, it's not out here walking around. It is in the protection of the womb of the mother, but it is as much of a, of a, of a person as I am. It, that little baby, it has its own DNA. That little baby, has, it has its own heartbeat. It has its own brain waves. It has its own blood. I mean, that little baby is growing in, inside that womb. And whenever someone says to me, you need to just leave that alone. The church needs to, the church needs to be silent. I beg to differ. I disagree 100%. I'm going to always stand for the life of the unborn. 
100%. It doesn't matter to me what any presidential candidate says. I'm going to stand for the life of the unborn. It doesn't matter to me. Listen, the Republican Party, I'm a Republican, and the Republican Party could put out on their platform that they are no longer pro-life, that they are pro-choice. Listen, I'm standing pro-life. It doesn't matter to me what a platform says, even though I am a Republican because of the Republican platform. And in the Republican platform, we stand for the life of the unborn. And so, but if they make that change, hey, I'm not changing. I'm not changing. My ideology and my policy uh, is not principled upon a platform of a party, but it is it is it is based upon the Bible and what the Word of God has to say. And so, I want to just stop. We're we're going to talk about this this episode, episode three. We're talking about the separation of church and state, and what does it really mean? Should Christians really be involved? Should Christians really be engaged in what is happening in our country? I'm going to go back to what I was talking about just a few moments ago, and that is to say this, that I believe that the reason why that we are in the shape that we are in in our country is because the Christian has vacated the political arena. I like to talk about the, the political uh, landscape. I like to refer to it as the political arena. And what has happened is the Christian has vacated the political arena. The Christian is no longer in the arena. The Christian is no longer fighting. I remember back in 2016, whenever President Trump was was one of 17 at the time, running for the Republican nominee. I remember sitting in this very living room and watching on my TV, watching the debates. Uh, my son and I, my uh, equipment, uh, he was just a young man at the time, around 9, 10 years old. And, and we would sit and we would watch uh, the the. Uh, the debates together, and he was a Trump fan right from the beginning. Now, in the beginning, I was with Ted Cruz. I was a Senator Ted Cruz. I knew a lot about Senator Cruz. I had followed him. I'd watched his bills. i listened to him debate. I was a huge Ted Cruz fan. Nothing against Donald Trump. I was just a Ted Cruz fan. And, of course, whenever Donald Trump became the nominee, I absolutely 100% supported Donald Trump. But I'm going to tell you what was happening. All over America, every state, Christians was involved. You scroll on social media and you would see preachers and you would see Christians commenting and posting how we need to get out and vote. And, and it's important for the Christian to get out and vote. There was fire there. There was fire. It reminds me of the stories that I've heard back in the 70s whenever the church was on fire and pastors and preachers and, and deacons and, and song directors and Sunday school teachers, how they were fired up about building a church for God. And that goes across every denomination, not just Baptist, but every denomination. The preacher was engaged, and the preacher was doing what the preacher could do in order to build a church for the kingdom of God. In 2016, the Christian and, and, the, and the pastors from all denominations, from all walks of life, was on fire in this political arena, doing all that they could to get the Christians out to vote. I'll never forget as I was watching as the numbers begin to come in. And there was a talk, you know, Hillary Clinton's up. Hillary Clinton's going to win. Hillary Clinton's going to win in a landslide. And, and CNN was reporting and all of these news stations. And as the night wore on, it became very clear that Donald Trump was indeed going to be the next president of the United States of America. Christians were weeping and crying. There was post on social media. I was watching as people was putting videos out about they were weeping and crying and thanking God that Donald Trump had won and had he had become the president of the United States of America. I watched the inauguration. I'll never forget as I was building, as Franklin Graham got up to speak and Franklin Graham got up to speak. Whenever he got up to speak, it started raining a little bit. It was amazing to watch as Franklin Graham got up and as he spoke, and then, of course, when Donald Trump got up and spoke, it was, it was tears ran down my face. Chill, I had chill bumps. I went to the very first national prayer breakfast there in Washington, D.C. President Trump was there. And I'll never forget as this admiral from the Navy, as he got up and as he spoke and as he began to talk about how he read his Bible and in, and in Genesis, he saw the Creator and and then in Exodus, and he went all the way through the Bible, and he was pointing out from different books in the Bible on what he, where, on where he saw Jesus. And I'll never forget, as we were sitting there, as we were listening, tears were running down my face. My dad was with me. Whenever this admiral finished speaking, the crowd got up and began to clap and cheer. President Trump stood up and was clapping. People were weeping and crying. That was 2017. 
2018 came. 2019. 2020 came. The Christian had lost its fire. The preachers were not trying to push to get out the vote like we did in 2016. The Christian, for the most part, disengaged. There was millions of Christians that stayed home and didn't vote, and I've heard lots of different reasons why. Some, some may be plausible and others were not. But for the most part, we got busy. For the most part, the Christian became disengaged. For the most part, we said it just it's not worth the time any longer. And so the Christian did not get out and vote. And I've heard so many different uh, things about 2020, about the election was stolen and the Democrats cheated. And I've heard this and I've heard that. And I'm not here to argue any of that. But what I will say is this. This is what I know for a fact, 100 percent, because I saw this with my own eyes. I heard this with my own ears and I felt this within my own body whenever it comes to the Christian. 2016, the Christian was on fire whenever it comes to this area of voting. They was working their tail off to get the vote out. And 2020, the fire was not there. And 2016, the Christian was engaged. The Christian was doing everything that they possibly could to get out to vote. There was uh, voter registration uh, drives going on. And there was all sorts of things going on to try to get people to the polls to vote. And 2020, that was not happening. The Christian disengaged. Let me make myself very clear. That's exactly what the left wants you and I to do. The left wants you and I to disengage and not be engaged in the political arena. Whenever we disengage and whenever we are not involved as Christians in this political arena, what happens is the left will win every single time. Joe Biden is president today. And listen, I'll hear, and I'm sure some of you will respond to this uh, video, and that's perfectly fine. And we all have our different opinions. And your opinion could be right. And your opinion could be wrong. My opinion, I believe it's right. And, and because I saw this happen uh, personally as far as Christians being involved in 2016 and then Christians not being involved in 2020. We won in 2016. We sent Hillary Clinton home in 2016, 2020. Trump was sent back to mar largo and Biden was sent to the White House. And I believe for the most part, it is because the Christian did not stay engaged as we were in 2016. And so whenever you look at this, that's exactly what the left wants. That's exactly what the Democrat Party wants. They want you and I to stay home. Listen to me very carefully. Carefully, The Christian, for the most part, is not going to vote uh, for a pro-choice candidate. They're just not going to. Uh, they're going to they're, they're either one, they're either going to stay home or they're just not going to vote. It's not happening. I'm talking about a Bible believing Christian. And let me just ask you a question. How can a Bible believing Christian vote for someone who is for murdering babies? Now, I don't understand that. No, you'll have to you have to come and talk to me and you'll have to you have to really dive deep into that one to try to un get me to even understand that you know, for a moment on how a Christian, I'm talking about someone who, who says that, you know, Jesus died for me. He rose good on the third day. I'm putting my faith and trust in Christ. I read my Bible. I pray. I go to church. But yet I'm going to vote for someone who is pro-choice. Like I, I, I have a hard time believing that a true Christian would vote for someone that's pro-choice. But what the left and what the Democrat Party wants to do is they want to say this. They want to say separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. You're a preacher. You shouldn't have a voice in this. But yet we'll listen to LeBron James give his viewpoint on who we should vote for. And nobody has say nothing. Why does LeBron James get to give his view, but a preacher can't? Why, does, why is it okay for LeBron James to get up and to talk about who we should vote for, but a Christian, uh, you better not do that, separation of church and state. How come people will let Taylor Swift, oh, she could get up and she could and she could nominate, you know, Joe Biden or she can endorse somebody and everybody will applaud her. And she's getting involved and, and let's give her a hand. And, and, and I'm OK with Taylor Swift and LeBron James giving their viewpoint. I have no problem with that. You know, I hear people say this. They'll say LeBron James just needs to play basketball. Well, in my humble opinion, I believe that LeBron James has just as much of a right to give his opinion as I have to give mine. And I'm not going to tell LeBron James just, just to dribble basketball and not to be involved. I think he ought to be involved as much as he possibly wants to, just like I think 
that every preacher in America are to be involved just as much as he or, or just as much as he wants to. And the same with Taylor Swift. The same with every one of them. Every it goes to all of them. But anytime a Christian wants to get involved, we start screaming separation of church and state. Any anytime a pastor gets involved, we scream separation of church and state. And let me tell you why. Because the ones that are screaming separation of church and state, they win when LeBron James speaks out and when we're quiet. They win whenever Taylor Swift speaks out and whenever we're quiet. But whenever we speak out, the crowd that is so anti-Christian you know, Christians speaking out, they lose because we're speaking out against pro-choice. We're speaking out for the life of the unborn. We're speaking out against this woke ideology that is sweeping our nation. We're, sweet, we're, we're speaking out against this uh, transgender movement. We're speaking out against guys playing in girls' sports. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I was watched the, I watched a little bit of the Iowa game, you know, the other night. I was watching Caitlin Clark, and that's the reason why I was watching, was to watch her play, and it was playing South Carolina, which is a very dominant, you know, uh, girls' basketball team. Very good. A uh, very good team, and and they won, I guess they won last year, and won again this year, and and beat Caitlin Clark. And, and, and their, their coach, South Carolina's coach the day before, was endorsing transgenders or guys playing in girls' sports. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous that a ladies' uh, basketball coach would be out there endorsing guys playing in girls' sports. But it's okay for her to endorse that. But you let a preacher speak out against that where it's separation of church and state. Well, let me get something. Let me just go and say this right now. And it'd be snowing in hell. They'll be, they'll be giving out ice cream cones. It won't be McDonald's because their ice cream machine's always broke, but it'd be like Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A will be serving ice cream in hell before this guy right here hushes in any of these topics. We're going to always speak out for the life of the unborn. We're going to always speak out against guys playing in girls' sports. I'm thankful that in Mississippi, in Mississippi, our legislators passed a bill that would not allow guys to play in girls' sports, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that our legislators in Mississippi... We passed the bill, our legislators in Mississippi passed the bill that eventually made its way to the Supreme Court that overturned Roe versus Wade. And I applaud them for that. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that here in Mississippi that we have some men and women who are who are willing to speak out for the life of the unborn and they're willing to speak out in this transgender area. But so many times people will say, well, Christians just need to be quiet. Separation of church and state. And I'm just going to say this again. Whenever we're quiet, the left wins. Whenever we're quiet, that woke crowd wins. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the Bible says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And listen to me very carefully. Satan has a stronghold in our country. And if we as Christians do not engage, then we're going to, we are absolutely 100% going to lose our country. I think the most important thing in this world there is nothing more important, in my opinion, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is getting out his message that Jesus died on the cross. He rose again on the third day. And if you're going to go to heaven, it's going to be through Jesus. There's no political affiliation that can get you to heaven. It's Jesus. There's no, there's no church that can get you to heaven. It is Jesus. He is the only way. The only way. And now whenever a person gets saved and as a Christian, I believe that it is important for, for myself as a man as a pastor, I'm, I need to be engaged in my family, I need to be engaged in my church, and I need to be engaged in my government. And Jesus, God set up all three. God set up the home, he set up the family whenever he created Adam and Eve. God set up the government there in the nation of Israel, uh, dealing with Abraham and dealing with Moses, and, and God set up, God set up, you know, the government, and then God set up the church. He started the church. And I believe that it is important as a Christian that I'm engaged in all three. Now, I have to have a balance. I cannot get over balance. I cannot be so focused on the government that I neglect my family or my church. I cannot be so focused on my church that I neglect my family and I neglect the government. I cannot be so focused on my family that I neglect the government or the church. I have to have a balance. And the Bible talks about that. But the Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So here's what I believe. I believe this. I believe that if Christians will engage, I believe that we can tear down these strongholds. I believe that we can keep this woke agenda out of our schools. I do believe that we can 
fight for the life of, of the unborn. I do believe that we can do these things. I like what the Bible says in Galatians 6, 9. This is my dad's, this is my dad's favorite uh, Bible verse. This is his life verse. He says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So many Christians, they get involved in the political arena, and they don't see the change that they want overnight. Here's what they do. They just quit. And they stop. They run for office, and they lose, and they say, well, I'm not running again, or I'm not going to be involved in, in running, and I'm not going to be involved in this arena no longer. I'm done. And so they quit. That is not what you and I should do as Christians. Listen to me. There's going to be setbacks. There are going to be times that we are going to lose, whether it's elections, we're going to lose elections, whether it's a, a particular bill that we're fighting for, uh, we might lose that. But we cannot quit. The Bible says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We must continue on. Listen, I want to encourage you, Christian. I want to encourage you, those that are involved in the political arena. Listen, whenever, whenever you lose a particular election or you lose on a particular bill, don't give up. Don't quit. That is not the time to quit. You, we, we might have to regroup, right? I mean, we might have to take a step back and say, we, we need to rethink this. Maybe we need to rethink our messaging. Maybe we need to look at, you know, what's happening here, but we can't quit. I'll never forget. Take a drink of my uh, sweet tea here. And there's nothing better, in my opinion, than a cold glass of sweet tea. My wife, she puts two and a half cups of sugar per gallon. And that is that is Southern sweet tea. If you're watching this and if you're in New York, you probably never have tasted real sweet tea in your life. I've traveled all over the, uh, the United States of America. And I can assure you that the only place where you're going to find good sweet tea is deep in the South. And if you ever come down here to the South, come look me up. I will treat you to some good sweet tea. You'll enjoy it. And I forget kind of what I was talking about a while ago. But what I was what I was referring back to was, you know, Christians being involved and Christians being engaged in the political arena and they lose and then they just quit. I remember back in uh, 2000 and I think it was 2017. Our governor appointed our state senator, you know, to a particular seat. And I was thinking and praying about running for office at that time. I had never ran for office before. I was involved in the I was involved in the Republican Party. I was involved in the Republican Club here in uh, in Harrison County, and I remember running for office. And there was another gentleman that was running as well. He's the one that won. His name was Joel Carter. So Joel and Howie ran against each other. And Joel today, he's a friend of mine. He's our state senator representing District 49. And so Joel and I we ran against each other. And there was another gentleman that was involved too that ran you know, for office as well. There was three of us, and, and Senator Carter, he came in first, and I came in second. I never forget one of the most, in my opinion, encouraging things happened to me during that election. After the election, uh, Joe and I, we became friends. I put a picture on Facebook. It was December 17th was the election, and Christmas was right around the corner, and because of everything that was happening and everything that was going on, I didn't have time to get a Christmas tree for my family. And so we just went and found one, and it was this small, you know, little four-foot tree, you know, that we found, and we're going to put the corner here, and, and that was the only thing that we could find. And I'll never forget, I put a picture of that on social media, and Joel, within like 30 minutes, Joel calls me. He says, hey, man, he goes, I, I have a Christmas tree that we're not using. Now, you got to remember, just two days before, me and this guy was running against each other, and he won the election. And so two days later, he's calling me on the phone, and he says, I have, he's got like a 10-foot beautiful Christmas tree. He said that we're not even using. He said, why don't you meet me at this, at this particular place, and I'm going to give you this tree. It was, it was one of the kindest things that anyone had done for my family at that time, you know, that, that year. It was whenever he reached out. We were running against each other. He won. I mean, he could have gloated. There's a lot of things that he could have done, a lot of things he could have said. But he reached out to my family, and he gave us, that Christmas tree, and that had an impact on my children. That had an impact on my family, and I appreciate that. That goes back to, you know, Christians being involved in the political arena. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Whenever you lose, you don't quit. You don't. You don't just not be involved. You don't just disengage like so many people do. You still you stay plugged in, and you continue on. Uh, that was December seventeenth. That was on a Tuesday that I lost that election. 
the very next day, the very next day, uh, they voted me in as the president of the Harrison County Republican Club, where I stayed for four years. During that four-year period, I cannot tell you how many Republican events I hosted uh, in here in Harrison County. It was uh, well over three or four a month, you know, that I was hosting. And so you could do, uh, do the math over a four-year period. You know, that's a lot of events that I was able to host and a lot of things that I was able to be involved in in the Republican Party. I'm not putting a feather in my hat. What I'm saying is this, that we lost, but we didn't quit. We continued on. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. If you lose, don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Man, stay involved. We need you to stay involved and stay engaged. Let me just reemphasize this again. Christian involvement in politics is not about imposing religious beliefs. Listen, I am not out here trying to impose Baptist beliefs on anyone, right? I am not. You know, I have Pentecostal friends. I am not trying to make them a Baptist, right? There are people that are in the Republican Party that are atheists. I'm not trying to make them a Baptist. You know, we have all different types of people and religions that are involved in the Republican Party. And I am not trying to turn them into a Baptist. Now, have we had many conversations about it? It happens. There's been many times that we've been at lunch and questions get asked, conversations get asked, and I have a perfect opportunity to share my faith about Jesus Christ. It happens all the time. All the time. It's happened probably twice in the last seven days to where somebody has asked me a question and I get to answer. Now, even at that point, I'm not trying to convert them to a denomination. I am just pointing them to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to make anyone a Baptist. I'm just going to point you to Christ. If you're a Pentecostal, I'm going to point you to Christ. If you're a Baptist, I'm going to point you to Christ. If you're a Catholic, I'm going to point you to Christ. So Christian involvement in politics, I'm not out here trying to impose my religious beliefs. And let me just say this. If only Baptists vote for you, you're going to lose. Hey, you're not going to win. If, only, if you only get the Baptist vote, you're going to lose. If you only get the Pentecostal vote, you're going to lose. If you only get the Catholic vote, you're going to lose. In order to win elections, you have to have you have to have the vote from all across the nominations. You have to have Baptists vote for you. You have to have Catholics vote for you. You have to have Pentecostals vote for you. You have to have all these people vote for you, which is important. You have to have their vote or you're not going to win. But listen to me very carefully. I can work with Pentecostals on policy that affects my everyday life and affects government without compromising my doctrinal belief. I can work with Catholics on bills and on policy. I can work with uh, all different types of religions on bills and policy without ever compromising my doctrinal beliefs. I believe the same thing today that I've ever believed. But a few years ago, we were trying to get a pill passed in Jackson whenever it come to life, and we were working with all different types of religions. And in order to get this bill passed, I never one time had to compromise my doctrinal beliefs. All I'm saying is this. That as a Christian and being involved in the political arena, I'm not out here trying to impose any of my doctrine on anyone. I'm not trying to impose my religious beliefs on anyone. All I'm trying to do is get good policy that affects the church and affects Christians. I'm just trying to get good policy passed. I'm just trying to get good Christian people elected, good conservative people elected. And so we need to see to understand that. But I will say this, Christian involvement in politics is not about imposing religious beliefs but about advancing policies that reflect God's heart for compassion, mercy, and righteousness. And that is where, whenever it comes to policy, that we have to stand and be bold as a lion and be a Christian and stand in the gap and say, listen, we are not, we're not here to impose our religious beliefs on anyone, but we're dead sure not going to let some dude go use girls' bathroom, right? That's not happening. Now, I'm not here trying to impose and make you a Baptist, but we're dead sure not going to just stand by and let you murder unborn babies. That's not happening. Hey, you know what? I'm not trying to make you a Baptist. I'm not even trying to get you in my church, but I'm dead sure not going to let some dude go play in girls sports. That ain't happening. And I can, I can stand for righteousness and I can stand for what's right. And at the same time, without compromise, without compromise. So many people think, well, well, in order to stand, I'm going to have to compromise. No, you're not. I don't go around singing kumbaya, you know, and holding hands with, with, with everyone and anyone. Not at all. But I am going to stand for what I believe in, no matter who makes bad. You know who gets more mad at me than anything about my political views and my political and being involved in the political arena is Baptists. They, they just get uncomfortable because they don't understand it. 
because even some of them, they don't understand, you know, about the separation of church and state. That the whole thing about separation of church and state is to keep the is to keep the the government out of the church's business, not the church out of the out of the government's business. And let me go back and just say this. Uh, this brings me to my next thing. The church is not a building. The church is not a building. So many people think that the church is these four walls. You know, I go to I go to church, and here's my here's where my church is at. No, no, I don't go to church. I am the church, right? I mean, it's people. People are the church, and so people are to be involved in their church, and people are to be involved in their government. For people to say separation of church and state, you know, and to say that that Christians should not be involved in government, that's saying to a whole bunch of people that you know what. If you go to church and if you're a Christian, then you shouldn't be involved in, in the political landscape. That's not how it ought to be. You and I need to understand that the church is people, people, and people pay taxes. People are to be engaged. People are to be involved in this political arena. When the church stands up, the government listens. You got to understand something. There are a lot of people that go to church. I mean, just look at our nation. Drive down your street drive around your town. There's a lot of churches, a lot of churches. And if the church would stand for what the church should be standing for, think about life. Of, I know I talk about that a lot, but it's just one of my main issues, life of the unborn. Whenever the church will stand for that, listen, there's not a, there's not a political, there's not an elected official anywhere that's going to buck against the church if they hear the church's voice. Now, I've heard a lot of rhetoric this week about pro-life and about abortion. And I'm going to say this again. I done said it once, and I'm going to say it again. It might, be, it might get me in trouble with some of you. I don't care what a political candidate has to say about the pro-choice or pro-life. We're going to always stand whenever it comes to we're going to always stand for life. Always. Always. And so and we need to let our voice be heard. Let your voice be heard. Don't cower down. Don't be silent. In this arena, let your voice be heard. The separation of church and state does not mean the separation of church and society. Let us bring our faith into the public square and shape a better world. Now, we can do that without imposing my religious beliefs. I can do that because, you know what? I'm, number one, I'm a Christian. And number two, I'm an American. And number three, I'm a Republican. And at the same time, as I'm fighting for what I believe in, you know what shapes my beliefs? What shapes my beliefs is my faith. What shapes my belief is my Bible and reading the Bible. And that is where I get my faith from. Uh, that's where I get my, you know, that's where I get a lot of the things that I believe. I get it from the Bible and I get it from the Word of God. And what I do is I use that and what I learn from the Bible and I use that to shape my, what I believe as an American and what I believe as a father and what I believe you know, as a Christian, and it helps shape that. Let me say this, the church should not be a bystander in the affairs of state. It ought to be a catalyst for change. Let us be active participants in building a society grounded in justice and mercy. That, it, that ought to be the church. That ought to be the people of the church. We are to be engaged. We are to be involved in what is happening. Listen, there are a lot of bills that are, that are right now being debated all over the United States of America. All over. And there are bills that are being debated in Jackson and Baton Rouge. There are bills that are being debated in Washington, D.C. And let me just say this for the Christians that are involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for standing and being involved. Thank you for shaping bills that helps people. Thank you for not being a coward. Thank you for whenever it does get hard, you continue on. Thank you for whenever it gets hard sometimes behind that podium as you're answering questions about bills. Thank you for not quitting. Thank you for whenever your bills don't get passed or your amendment doesn't get passed. Thank you for not stopping and just throwing in the towel and quitting. Thank you for not, as what a lot of kids do, take your ball and go home. Thank you for persevering. Thank you for standing whenever things get hard. Thank you for standing Whenever sometimes you feel like you're all alone and you're the only vote in the Senate or you're the only vote in the House, either way, thank you. You know, thank you to every Republican. Thank you to every Democrat. Thank you to every independent. Thank you to every constitutionalist and the, and the constitutional party. Thank you to every 
Libertarian. Thank you for being engaged and being involved. I wish everybody was. Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back. The my pillow guy. And you're looking good. I'm still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever. My pillow 2.0. <gasps> wow, it's so soft and smooth. It's cool to the touch. How did you do that? Well, we took my pillow's patented bill and combined it with this new technology that we didn't have back then when I invented my pillow to bring you the best pillow in history, my pillow 2.0. Just like all of you, I never imagined that my pillow could get any better. That's why I haven't changed it in nearly 20 years. Then I heard about a revolutionary new technology and I knew I had to bring it to you all. My pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of my pillow. The my pillow 2.0 is cooler and softer than the last my pillow. It is so comfortable to sleep on at night. I look forward to going to bed and I wake up well rested in the morning. Sleep is all about temperature and height. My pillow 2.0's patented adjustable fill is going to give you the exact individual support you need from your head to your bed. And now here's where it gets even better. We've all experienced those temperature related sleep interruptions where you get too hot, you toss and turn, you flip your pillow over to the cool side. Well, all that's gone with my brand new MyPillow 2.0 cooling fabric that's made with temperature regulating thread. The best sleep just got even better. Whether you have a MyPillow or not, you need to get the brand new MyPillow 2.0. Call or go to MyPillow.com now. Use your promo code and for a limited time when you buy one, you'll get a second one absolutely free. You're sleeping even better. And cooler, too. And you're looking good. Feeling good. I knew you would. Visit MyPillow.com. I wish every single American was involved in the process. I wish everybody knew what was going on in Jackson and in Baton Rouge and in Washington, D.C. and in every capital across America. If more people were watching, if more people were tuned in to what was going on in our capitals, a lot of these legislators would be a whole lot more careful in what they were voting on and passing. They, they would be, they, they would be some fear there. Well, I have to be careful about voting on this because I've got this group watching. I've got to be careful about voting on this because these people are watching. And so that's why it's so important for you and I to be involved and to be engaged. I like what Thomas Jefferson said. Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, the God who gave us life. Well, what's he doing talking about God? Doesn't Thomas Jefferson know that there's separation of church and state? Doesn't he know? I mean, he's one of our founding fathers, is he not? Doesn't he know that he should not be bringing God into this equation? I mean, doesn't Thomas Jefferson, didn't somebody tell him that he should not be speaking out about what he believes in? Somebody should have warned Thomas Jefferson. Somebody should have sat him down and somebody should have said, you shouldn't be talking about God. Huh. But I like what he said. He said, the God who gave us life gave us liberty. At the same time, the hand of, of force may destroy, but cannot disjoin them. The God who gave us life gave us liberty. Listen, Christian, you have liberty to be involved. You have liberty to be engaged. Listen to me, preacher. You've got liberty to be involved. You've got liberty to be engaged. I like what Benjamin Franklin said. Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, God, once again, I don't know what he's doing talking about God. Somebody should have told him. Someone should have told Benjamin Franklin that we got to keep church and, and, and the government separated. Like somebody should have warned Franklin. Somebody say, hey, Benjamin, hey, you can't talk about God. Now, you can't talk about God here, uh, Benjamin Franklin. We got to keep God separate. But no, no, Benjamin Franklin said this, uh, one of our founders. He said, God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? What Benjamin Franklin was saying was this. He was simply saying that a sparrow cannot fall without God taking notice and an empire cannot rise without the aid of the Almighty. That's what Franklin was saying. And the reason why the United States of America has grown to such power and the reason why our nation has grown to such beauty and to such wealth is because of men like Thomas Jefferson who understood the importance of God being involved. Men like Benjamin Franklin who understood the importance of God being involved, and Christians from the very beginning up until now who understood 
the importance of God being involved, but there's an agenda out there from the left, and there's an agenda out there from a lot of the Democrat Party and from that woke crowd that wants to silence our voice and that wants to get rid of God altogether. That's why they said you can't have Bible in school. That's why they say you can't pray in school. They want to get rid of God in every area. They want to get rid of our Creator. They want to get rid of him. I like what Patrick Henry said. He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often <coughs> that this great nation was founded. Boy, this is, this is going to be hard for some of you to stomach. <laughs> he said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why didn't someone tell Patrick Henry that we got to keep God out of this. <laughs> Why didn't someone raise their hand and say, Patrick Henry, uh, you can't bring God and Jesus into this. You can't bring the gospel into this. Hey, we got to keep that separate. No, 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 no. Patrick Henry understood. Patrick Henry knew that this country was founded upon the word of God. This country was founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, not by religionists, but by Christians. And that's what Patrick Henry said. And that's what he believed. Listen to me very carefully. I like what John Jay said. You ever heard of John Jay? He was the president of the Continental Congress from 1778 to 1779. He was the first chief justice of the United States from 89, from 1789 to 1795. John Jay said this. He said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of a Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Listen to me very carefully. Why didn't someone stand up right then and say, hey, John Jay, you can't talk about Christians. Christians can't be involved in this in this cycle. Hey, whenever it comes to electing people, uh, Christians shouldn't be involved and Christians shouldn't be engaged. No, no, because our founding fathers knew the importance of Christians being involved. They understood the importance of Christians being engaged in the political arena. That's why whenever they wrote the Constitution, that's why there's over 17 biblical principles in our Constitution. That is why in the Declaration of Independence, that it is it has got Bible all throughout it because they understood the importance of having God involved and having Christians engaged in the political process. It was the early stages of our nation as they was preparing and as they was writing the Constitution that they could not come to an agreement. They were fighting and they were having arguments and they were having debate and, and he was going nowhere. One of our founding fathers stood and he said, men, I recommend that we separate for three days and that we fast and that we pray. After three days, let's come back. They separated for three days, our founders. When they come back after three days of prayer and of fasting, they wrote the greatest document outside of the Bible. And that's the Constitution. It is important. It is imperative that Christians stay engaged in the political arena. It was 1964. The Civil Rights Act was uh, was approved and voted on. And it was led by Christians. Christians were involved. Christians were engaged. There was various countries, uh, countries all over the world where there was a large, significant Christian population that passed these anti-abortion bills and anti-abortion legislation, but it was because Christians were involved and Christians was engaged. And 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act was passed in the United States of America. And the reason is because Christians were involved. Christians were engaged. And it said this, that marriage is between one man and one woman. Now, today they're trying to change that. They're trying to say that a man can marry a man. He can marry a dog if he wants. A woman can marry a woman. A woman can marry whoever she wants. A man can marry whoever he wants. And I mean, we could just all be one big happy family. But there was Christians involved in 1996 that said marriage is between one man and one woman. And it's 2024. And I believe that's what marriage is. Marriage is still one man and one woman. And there was Christians who got this passed, this legislation passed. There was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1993 that was passed. And a large part, it was a lot of Christians that was involved. 
the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case. Uh, it was not a bill, but it was a Supreme Court case that was Burwell versus Hobby Lobby that is a 2014 that had significant implications for religious freedom and the United States. This case involved a challenge to the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate by the owners of Hobby Lobby, a Christian-owned business. And so it was once again Christians involved and Christians standing and fighting. It was in 2001 the No Child Left Behind Act was passed here in the U.S. Once again, it was passed largely because Christians was involved. In India, there was the Defense of Religion Act that was passed, and it was largely because Christians was involved and Christians was engaged. In 2003, there was a Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act here in the United States that was passed. It was supported by many Christians, by many Christian groups advocating for the protection of the unborn. Once again, it was Christians involved and Christians engaged. In 2013, in the United Kingdom, they passed the Marriage Equality Act, and it was, went across various countries, but it was because Christians were involved. Christians were engaged. And in, in the United States, there was another faith-based community initiative where various bills and executive orders had aimed to promote partnerships between government agencies and religious organizations to address social issues such as poverty, substance abuse, and homelessness. And it was because Christians got involved and Christians got engaged. There's a program called, <coughs> excuse me, Reformers Unanimous. And my dad's church has Reformers Unanimous. They meet every Friday night. I remember before the program kicked off and even throughout the program, we will meet with judges and different people. And they would come and they would send people to our church on Friday night for the Reformers Unanimous program who was having maybe, they was having maybe drug abuse or maybe alcohol abuse or maybe a uh, casino. They was um, addicted to gambling. And, but yet, they would send them to our church so that they could get help, so that they could get freedom. And it was because Christians was involved. Christians was engaged. There was the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act here in the United States. It was at federal and state levels, and it was seeking to ban abortions. Listen, the list goes on and on and on of bills that was passed in states and bills that were passed in Washington, D.C., and it was because Christians were involved. Christians were engaged. So whenever somebody comes to me and they say, you need to be quiet, separation of church and state. Well, I can understand why. Look, I can understand why some dude that wants to dress like a woman, that wants to put on a skirt and put on a pair of thong panties and put on a bunch of makeup and get a wig and go to some library and dance in and twerk in front of a bunch of five and six year old little girls. I can understand why a pervert likes that wants a man like me to be quiet. I can understand why he wants me to not say anything because I'm gonna call him out. I'm gonna call him for what he is. I'm gonna call you a pervert because that's what you are. I can understand why he wants somebody like me to be quiet because they can get their way. They can go and do what they wanna do. They can go and, and dress like that and dance in front of these five and six year old little girls and try to convert them and brainwash them into thinking that that's okay. But it's never going to be okay in my book. I'm never, ever going to sit by and just let that happen and be silent. I can understand why some dude that wants to go into a girl's bathroom and, and use the restroom, I can understand why he wants me to be quiet. I get it. And listen, if I was like them, if I was a pervert like that, I'd want me to be quiet too. I'd scream and I'd holler, separation of church and state. You need to be quiet. But it's okay for them to go march down the street. It's okay for them to try to convert our little children. It's okay for them to try to brainwash our children. It's okay for them to do perverted acts in our libraries and them try to get the state to fund it. But they want people like me to be quiet. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've got news for you. It ain't happening. I'm just 42 years old and I hope I get to live to be 150. I hope one day that I'm doing an interview and I'm sitting on my front porch and I'm sitting in a rocking chair. And maybe I'm drinking a glass of sweet tea, possibly even smoking a cigar at 150 years old and somebody comes up and they interview me. And they say, Dan, you've been living on this earth for 150 years. You're the oldest living man. And for 150 years, from today I'm 42, and for the next 108 years, I will be screaming the same thing. And my voice will still be just as loud as it's ever been. And I'll still be saying that these perverts aren't, shouldn't be doing that. 
and that Christians are to be involved in the political arena and that we don't need to cower down and we don't need to quit and we don't need to stop. We need to let our voice be heard. Absolutely, Hillary Clinton wants me to be quiet. 100%. Absolutely, Joe Biden wants to scream separation of church and state, but it's okay for him to go to churches. But absolutely, he wants me to be quiet because I'm not pushing for anybody to vote for him. I don't think a Christian, I don't think a Christian in America are to vote for Joe Biden. But oh yeah, they want us to be quiet. There's a reason why. When we're silent, whenever we're quiet, they can easily pass anything they want to pass. But somebody needs to be standing up and saying it ain't happening. Christian, I would encourage you. You say, Dan, this 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 world going crazy. And it is. It is going crazy. I don't know about you, but I watch the news. I listen to the news every morning as I drive to work. I'll I'll scroll on the news and I'll read various uh, different articles throughout the day. And I'll see what's happening all over our nation. I'll read things, you know, that the president has said. I'll read, you know, whatever he made the proclamation about Easter Sunday being Transgender Day. And I know that that wasn't something that he necessarily set. I knew that it was set before him, but but he should have been smarter than that. You don't make the most um, holiest day of the year. You don't turn that into Transgender Day. It's unbelievable. And I read things that are happening, and I read what's happening in our schools, that, and yes, people are going crazy. Yes, things are looking bad. And yes, things are looking tough. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to always come back and I'm going to always pivot to this. That the reason is because the church went silent. Listen to me very carefully. A silent church is a dead church. And I'm not talking about necessarily people in the crowd saying amen and running the aisles and all and swinging from the chandeliers. I'm not speaking of that. I mean, there are some churches that they have all that going on and they're as dead as a, as a doorknob. All because they're screaming and running around doesn't mean that that church is alive. It just means that they have a lot of action. There's a lot of action, a lot of different places and the church is dead. But a silent church is a dead church. A church that is silent whenever it comes to the gospel, is a dead church. A church that is not trying to get out the good news of Jesus Christ is a dead church. A church that is not trying to teach truth and trying to disciple is a dead church. A church that is silent on these issues, in my opinion, is a dead church. How can we let this stuff go on and not speak out about it? Uh, There was a couple of years ago, last year, in Slidell in St. Tammany Parish, there was a war going on whenever it comes to some of these books that are being taught and being read in some of our schools. There was there's some things that's written in some of these books and some of these libraries that would make you and I blush. I mean, it's talking about, and it was even here in Mississippi, these are books that are in some of our children's classes in their libraries, like fifth grade, where it's boys and girls that are talking about, uh, I mean, just unbelievable stuff that I'm not even going to mention here on on the show, but it's unbelievable. I am thankful. I am thankful that there were Christians in Mississippi who stood up and said, it ain't, that, this is not right. We, we cannot allow this to continue on. We fought it hard in St. Timothy Parish, and we voted and voted that out. It happened here in Mississippi. People were threw a fit about it, and in some cases, we were able to get rid of some of that stuff, but it was because the Christian let their voice be heard. The Christian said, enough is enough. You say, Dan, what happens if I'm the only one? Listen, number one, you're not the only one. I think about the story of Elijah in the Bible and how he he said he was talking to God. He said, I'm the only one that's serving you. I mean, everybody else has already quit. Everybody else has thrown the towel. Everybody else has done bowed the knee to Baal. And God said, that's not true. There are 7,000. There are 7,000 that hasn't bowed the knee. Listen, you're not going to be the only one. I mean, you might be the only one for a day or two, but I can assure you, I can assure you that if you'll just stand, somebody come stand with you. I'll never forget, there was several years ago, uh, there were some things that happened, and I didn't necessarily like the way that some things were going. And somebody asked me the question, 
very pointed question. They said, I, I was complaining on the phone to them. And they said, Dan, what are you going to do about it? Hmm. I thought for a moment. I said, what do you, what do you mean? They said, are you just going to run your mouth about it? Or, or are you going to do something about it? What are you going to do? I said, well, I'm just one person. And all I am is one person. I'm just one voice. And they said, you let that voice be heard. You stand. You let your voice be heard. You stand for what you believe in. And they said, Dan, people will come and stand with you. I'll never forget. I got home that night. I went to my computer and I started a Facebook page. And I called it a certain, I called it Let Mississippi Vote. <laughs> I started the Facebook page. And then I started a group for Harrison County. And then I started a group for Jackson County. And I started a group for Hancock County. I met Alan Sibley, who became one of my best friends. And I started meeting people all over, all over Mississippi. And I met Miss Catherine and I met Miss Holly. And I met, I mean, the list goes on and on and on of people, you know, that I met. And we started uh, We the People of Harrison County. We the people of Stone County. We the people of Jefferson Davis. And we the people of DeSoto. And eventually we had a county for, we had a group for every single county in Mississippi, all 82 counties. There was people from all over the state, thousands of people that was involved, thousands of people that was engaged in what we were trying to do. Just one person, just one person. People will come. You see, Satan wants you and I to believe that that if we stand, that people are going to mock and people are going to make fun and that people are not going to stand with you. But that's not true. That's a lie. I can tell you story after story after story of men and women in the Bible and men and women in history that stood. And yes, some of them lost everything. I think about our founding fathers and they lost everything because they were willing to stand. But look at what they birthed. I've got five children. Five children. My wife and I, we've been married for 17 years. And I'll never forget whenever she said to me, she goes, babe, I'm, she's going to have a baby. And she showed me the pregnancy test. I'll never forget, we invited her mom and dad and her brothers and sisters and my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest of 11. And we invited all of them. And we all went to IHOP. And this has been 16 years ago. We went to IHOP. And we were all sitting there at the table. And I went and got a, a, um, a, a, a baby chair. And I brought that baby chair out. And it was signifying to them and I had that pregnancy test, and it was signifying to all of them that Jack and I were going to have a baby. One month goes by, two months, three months, four months, and she begins to grow. Her, her little belly begins to grow. Quitman, who my son, he's 16 years old now, and he works at Chick-fil-A, doing a good job. He's growing inside of her. I remember some mornings where she would have morning sickness, and it would be hard, and it would be tough. I remember bringing home crackers and she had um, different things that she wanted, you know, whether it was, you know, like watermelon and peanut butter. I mean, just some, just all kind of crazy stuff, you know, that she wanted. And then finally we got past the morning sickness and we got into phase two and four months and five months, and six months, went seven months, eight months. Now we're getting right down to the time. She's ready to give birth. I'll never forget. It was a Sunday morning. She was driving to church. She went to go pick up some girls for church. While she was driving to pick up girls for church, her water broke. And she calls me and she says, what do I do? I was like, I guess bring them girls to church and get to the hospital. I don't know what you do. So she is speeding to get to church and she gets pulled over by a police officer. And he says, young lady, why, why are you driving so fast? She said, my water just broke. And he's like, the hospital's that away. She said, I know, but my husband said, I got to get these girls to church. And then I'm going to go to the hospital. So I was a young dad. I don't recommend that. You know, I was very, I was very unwise. I should have been like, babe, go to the hospital. We'll get the girls to church another way. But she gets to the hospital. She gives birth to equipment. It was, it was, it was rough. I can't speak for her. She's not in here. But I can speak for me. It was rough. <laughs> I mean, I had to sit there and and uh, and watch all of it take place. And it was, she was in pain. And there was nothing I could do except just sit there. But nine months, that rough, hard day of labor, she gave birth to equipment. I'll never forget holding it. I'm looking at it and tears running down my face. On my face. 
there was so much work that she gave to birth this baby. But it was well worth it. It was well worth it. To birth a movement is going to take work. To birth this nation, it took work. But looking back is well worth it. To birth your church takes work. To birth a marriage, a good marriage, it takes work. But it's worth it. So many people in the birthing process, they give up and quit. So many people in the birthing process, they throw in the towel. It gets hard at church, and so they quit. It gets hard in, in the political movement that we're trying to birth, and so they quit. They throw in the towel. I want to encourage you. If I can just leave you with anything, let us not be weary in well-doing. Let us not quit. Let us not faint. Let us not give up in this birthing process. Let us persevere. Let us continue on. Maybe you're watching today and you say, Dan, I am tired. I just want to quit. I just want to throw in the towel. I've had enough of this. Don't quit. Continue on. Yes, the birthing process is hard. Yes, it is heavy. But continue on because at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you're going to look back and you're going to say, I am so thankful that I did not quit this movement that you might be trying to birth. You go talk to people and they not, they're not as excited about it as you are. I mean, it's your idea. It's your baby. And so when you talk to them and they don't have the, they don't have that, that excitement that you have and it can be discouraging to you. Sometimes at that moment we want to quit. Or we have an event and no one shows up. Listen, I cannot tell you how many events I posted over our great state. It's in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of events. And I have spoken at hundreds and hundreds of events and at hundreds and hundreds of churches. I cannot tell you how many times I've got up and spoke. If one person show up. One person. I'll never forget one time I drove three hours one way to an event. And the person that was hosting the event forgot to send out invitations about the event and no one showed up. The person that was hosting the event forgot about it, and they didn't even show up until last minute. And there's some reasons why. I mean, I try to call them and never get in touch with them, but I and still no one showed up. I've showed up and won a person. I've showed up and there'd be five people. I've showed up and there'd be 10,000 people. You know? I've showed up and there'd be 500 people, 1,000 people. And the days where there's 5,000, and then the days where there's one, and the days when there's none... You continue on. You continue on. You just say, you know what? It doesn't matter how many, if there's just that one. You never know. You could be speaking to the next Donald Trump. You could be speaking to the next George Washington. It could be the next Thomas Jefferson. It could be the next Benjamin Franklin. You don't know who you're talking to. So focus on that one. Yes, things are going to be hard. Yes, things can be difficult as you're trying to birth this movement, or as you're trying to get something done, you're trying to birth this bill, and, and this bill is hard, and it's difficult, and yet sometimes you just want to quit and throw in the towel, and people aggravate you, and, and your people that, uh, that, that, you know, your constituents, they aggravate you, and they get on your nerves, and you got somebody like me calling, and somebody like me texting you, and, and pushing this way, and you've got this person pushing this way, and you've got this legislator pushing this way, and the lieutenant governor pushing this way, and then a speaker pushing this way. And you've got all these people pushing you in different directions. And sometimes we just want to say, enough's enough. I'm, I'm, I'm done. It could be like that in church. It could be like that in your family. We have to continue. We have to continue. So I just want to encourage you. Separation of church and state? I believe in separation. I believe that the state ought to stay out of the church's business. But I believe that the church, the people of God, are to be involved in the state's business. Thank you for tuning in. I pray that you have a great and wonderful day. If you haven't already shared the episode, I would encourage you to do so. You, whether you're watching this on YouTube, Twitter, whether you're watching this on Substack, Lindell TV, no matter where you're watching, share. It helps us get out our message. God bless you. And God bless the great United States of America. Hey guys, it's Reed here. I don't say this about a lot of people, but I have to say Mike Lindell is a real patriot. 
and we could not be more thankful to him and my pillow for sponsoring today's episode of God and Country. Remember, go to mypillow.com and save huge on a great night of sleep by entering the promo code Midnight Ride. Thanks. <laughs> 